Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the All Saints podcast. Uh, what I want to share with you today uh, comes mainly from our second men's discipleship breakfast of the year, which was on May the 7th, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, you remember that this series that we're in at the moment, uh, Pursuing Maturity in Christ, uh, began with the first Men's Discipleship Breakfast of the Year, when I talked in detail through quite a small print two-side uh, summary or manifesto of uh, what I think may be a helpful model for pursuing maturity in Christ. And what it boils down to is, as you'll know if you've um, listened to previous podcasts in this series, is the observation that the biblical pattern for growing towards maturity as a human being following Jesus is childhood. And childhood is a time during which our parents impose upon us structures that cultivate certain habits, and the habits then result in certain uh, facets of our character, and that character is supposed to be Christ-like. And so my suggestion is, following that biblical pattern, that we may be able to able to pardon me that we may be able to overcome uh, some of the struggles that we sometimes have with persistent or besetting sins by reinstantiating in adult a version of that childlike way of growing up. That is to say, we seek to provide for ourselves new structures that will uh, form in us new habits and creating us a Christ-like character. Now to do that, we're gonna to have to provide for ourselves all the things that our parents previously provided for us because we're not kids, we're adults, at least I'm an adult, and I suspect that most of the people listening to this are. If you're not, you're in a very fortunate position, but similar considerations will apply to you um, depending on your age. Uh, but suffice it to say that we will have to do the job of our parents if we're adults, which will include at least five things, accurate self-diagnosis, clear goals, well-defined structures put in place, which will cultivate those habits and so on, track our own progress because our parents won't do it for us, and finally, we'll need to be committed to the task because there's nobody else to hold us accountable to it than ourselves. So um, uh, what we're going to do, uh, with the, yeah, getting tangled up, uh, the uh, previous um, men's breakfast has just, just um, passed. Basically, what we did was to start putting that into practice by getting the men there to the point of, uh, at the end of the session, uh, seeking to spend five minutes diagnosing three areas of their lives that, truth be told, are not Christ-like as they ought to be. And that's the important first step. I don't think it's the hardest step, but it's a step that many people never even take ever in their lives, of actually sitting down and writing, defining in any kind of detail, here are two or three things about my life which are not Christ-like, which I'd like to grow in. And so those guys, I, I was really thrilled and delighted, um, as uh, I often, or almost always, I think, I think I always have been since I've been at All Saints, been delighted by the response to the Men's Discipleship Breakfast. We had 60-something guys there, and it was an encouragement to me. I hope it was an encouragement to them. And we had some great conversations during and after that time, so I hope that's helpful. There's a bunch of other stuff leading up to that um, yeah, in the uh, time we spent together. It's about an hour in length. Some of it will be edited out at the end just because it was five minutes of silence mostly, so that will be removed, but um, I hope that will be helpful to you. What I do want to do is just to uh, pick up something that uh, we talked about a little bit in last week's, or well, last Wednesday's Bible study, that's two days ago, which isn't going to be on the podcast this week. I think the Men's Discipleship Breakfast will be more useful. Um, and uh, But nonetheless, there were some really, really helpful things, and some of them we're going to pick up in the future. This is another reason why I don't think it, we won't include the Wednesday night Bible study um, this time around. Um, basically, there's one thing we talked about which we're going to uh, pick up in the future, uh, which uh, is this bunch of books here um, by James Smith, Desiring the Kingdom, uh, Imagining the Kingdom, and Awaiting the King. This is his so-called Cultural Liturgies series, which has been quite influential in certain Christian circles and is really quite good. Um, it's not an easy read, but it's a very worthwhile one. Each of these books is 200 and something pages. Um, but I'm hoping to do some teaching later in the summer um, talking about how these books relate to what we've been talking about. And briefly, what James Smith highlights is that um, the way that our lives are shaped is by our desires or our loves being cultivated in certain directions. And the things that cultivate our desires are what he calls rituals, sometimes explicitly uh, 
cultic or rituals to do with worship, sometimes cultural um, rituals or cultural liturgies is the phrase he uses. Now that keys into the habits and character uh, framework we've been talking about, because just as habits lead to character, so certain patterns of life or liturgies lead to desires or loves. So I think there's an overlap there, and I'm going to be talking about that in more detail in the next couple of months, Lord willing. So I won't talk about it in great detail now. I just trailed it slightly in um, Wednesday night Bible study. And so I wanted to mention that here. The other thing I want to mention from Wednesday night, which was a really, really helpful question. There were a bunch of good questions, which we won't talk about. They'll come up at some other time, I'm sure. But uh, one question that arose in response to my uh, statement that I thought the hardest of these five practical points was well-defined structures. Just recall the five um, things that we need to do for ourselves that our parents used to do for us are accurate self-diagnosis, clear goals, well-defined structures, uh, tracking progress, and absolute commitment to the task. I've said a number of times that uh, in my experience, the hardest to help people with are the structures to put in place to reinstantiate the, the habits that we're looking to cultivate and to produce the character that we want to see in ourselves. Now, why is this? The question is, why are the structures the hardest thing to do? And I think the answer is, at least in part, that our lives are complicated. And this can most easily be seen by comparison with uh, the life of a child in which parents deliberately uh, make the child's life simple in order to inculcate certain habits which will uh, create the character of a godly young lady or godly young man. Uh, so let me give you an example of how a child's life is simple. And we used to do something like this with our kids when they were younger. Imagine you've got three children like we have. You want to teach them kindness and generosity and uh, mutual respect and honouring one another. So I think we did this a few times. We'd give um, one of the children uh, three cookies, um, or if we just had two of them at the time, we'd give them two cookies or two pieces of candy and we'd say, OK, before you have yours, you've got to give one to Ben or you've got to give one to Becky or you've got to give one to Abby. Uh, and so you can see what you've got. You've got this extremely simplified situation. One child, three pieces of candy, two siblings. And all they've got to do is, you know, okay, I've got to do that, give these pieces to these other two, and then I can eat mine, and then we're good. Um, now, what that little ritual or habit does, or the structure that gives rise to that habit does, is to create a really complex set of character traits over time uh, habits like that create a disposition of kindness and grace and generosity, which will then function in far more nuanced and complex and uh, complicated situations in life, where it's not just you and three cookies and two other people. You've got a whole bunch of other competing demands, but the underlying character trait of generosity and kindness will still be there. Now, the problem is where we find ourselves as adults is we're in those complicated situations. And the whole point about adult life in this connection is that we can't just step away from all those responsibilities and go back to a super simple world where I'm sitting in a chair with three cookies and two people and I'm learning generosity by doing that. That's just not how we function. And so because of the complexity of the situations in which we find ourselves, that's what gives rise to the difficulty of formulating structures to teach ourselves godly habits and godly character. Um, you think of some other examples, um, perhaps by considering something which in adult life is relatively easy to uh, put in place. Suppose you've got somebody who just doesn't have a, a habit of regular Bible reading and has no real thirst, therefore, for the word of God, and they realise this is a problem. Well, what you can do is just put something in their day um, like 10 minutes in the morning with a mug of coffee and a Bible and a comfortable chair and your no distractions. So your phone's over the other side of the room or in the house or switched off or something. And you encourage them just to embrace that habit. But again, you see that is a very, very simplified part of their life. Most of their life is much more complicated than that. So if they've got a problem with, I never really spend time reading and the Bible and praying, you can probably address that with a structure that's comprehensible and easy to devise. But if the problem is more complex, like there are just tensions in the way that you relate to uh, a relative in your family, perhaps a spouse, or um, you have a, uh, you're you struggling with dealing with temptations to pornography or something of that kind. Well, the circumstances in which those problems that you're trying to deal with arise are very varied and very complex. 
and it's hard to design a structure that will help you to deal with them. So what that means in practice, it seems to me, is this is the point uh, at which pastoral counsel and perhaps the involvement of other people, like the person you're relating to who you've got trouble relating with, is most valuable. Uh, one of the things that I said in um, Wednesday night, uh, which I've talked about uh, previously in this series, is that pastoral counseling is not the solution to systemic problems of ungodly habits and the resulting ungodly character. Pastoral counselling can be the solution to certain kinds of question or difficulty, but when there's a systemic character, behavioural, lifestyle issue at stake, going to get advice doesn't change the underlying pattern of behaviour. But what it could do, and where I've seen it actually bear tremendous fruit really quite quickly in a period of weeks or months, what pastoral counselling of some kind can do is to help us to create the uh, structures that will help us to correct the kind of patterns of life that we're frustrated with and want to be rid of. In other words, I don't know what to do to help myself to have a better relationship with my brother. Well, sit down with your pastor and see if you can work on frameworks for approaching life and frameworks for approaching those more complex situations, which will help you to instantiate better habits in them and therefore create in yourself uh, a more godly character. That I think is a very, very helpful um, a way to approach what I do think is the most difficult aspect of these five practical steps. Okay, so we'll talk about those things I think um, at some future time. Um, desiring the kingdom, imagining the kingdom and, wait, and awaiting the king, Jamie Smith, we're going to come back to that at some point in the future and we may spend uh, two or three sessions looking at that because it's really rich and deep material. Uh, we'll have to see how much time we have and how deeply I get into it. Uh, but for now, I um, hope you enjoy listening in on our Men's Discipleship Breakfast from May 7th, 2022. I had a wonderful time. Very grateful to the guys who were, who came and participated. Uh, I was tremendously encouraged. I, I think they seem to be as well. Certainly we had a good time. We had some great food and some great fellowship. And I think the teaching was helpful too. So hope you find it helpful. That'll do for now. The Lord bless you. Take care and see you next time. Bye for now. First of all, Father, we are grateful to you for every good gift you've showered upon us, how you've blessed us. We look around us even now and we see a company of brothers in Christ and uh, the food that we've enjoyed and how many of our brothers and sisters across the globe would love to be sitting here with us. Wouldn't it be? How, what a joy it would be for our brothers in Ukraine to be able to join us here. And they can't. Um, and you have given us much very, very much. From those to whom much has been given, much is required. Your word says so. And uh, we confess that sometimes we become so preoccupied with our own imagined uh, strife and difficulties, uh, or so depressed with our own imagined failings, that uh, we produce little. We become unproductive. And our forefathers in the faith and our brothers and sisters in Christ across the globe would look at us with dismay, thinking, what are those guys doing? They have resources of which we cannot dream and yet do so little with it. So we confess to you, first father, our sins of omission, and we praise you for the forgiveness that's ours in Christ. And we come to you now as renewed new men, uh, excited to sit under your word and at the feet of your son to be taught and trained. We want to be more faithful disciples. We want to be emissaries of Jesus cheerful and joyful and fruitful and productive and godly and gracious and courageous and displaying every virtue in abundant measure. And we know that means we need to look at ourselves pretty seriously from time to time. And this is going to be one such time we pray. And so make it so we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Okay. The title at the top of the white sheet today, Christian diagnose thyself is obviously a pun of some kind from uh, Luke 4, where Jesus was unjustifiably, well, he was anticipating being unjustifiably told to examine or um, heal himself. Like, people would suggest that he's got a problem that needs to be fixed. That's not true. Um, however, uh, we do have a problem that needs to be fixed, and there, there arises the title and the theme for today's Men's Discipleship Breakfast. Um, 
Uh, I want to recap to begin with, and you'll find roughly I'm going to be talking through what's on the sheet here. Um, and don't worry too much if I spend quite a lot of time on the first two or three inches. We speed up after that, and um, then we'll make some progress. Um, uh, most, if not almost all of you, were here a couple of months ago when I talked through this um, uh, sheet, uh, double-sided. I did what I almost never do, which is to write out in full pretty much what I wanted to say and then comment on it as I went. Uh, that's headed Pursuing Maturity in Christ. And in it, I laid out... Um, uh, a philosophy of Christian growth, which I believe may be helpful to us. Let me briefly, as briefly as I can, summarize what's on that sheet, just to remind everybody um, and to uh, give a quick heads up to those who weren't here um, a couple of months ago. Um, the Christian life is about pursuing maturity in Christ, which means Christ-likeness in every area of life. And over time, we see in ourselves a certain amount of progress by God's grace, but also we see in ourselves, and sometimes we see in others, um, uh, complete lack of progress. We get stuck in certain areas. Um, and indeed, sometimes t- terribly, um, Christians and we even ourselves regress and become less mature, less faithful, less godly. And it raises the question, what do you do about that? And what people normally do is either get depressed and give up or just keep trying harder and feel like they're banging their head against a brick wall. It raises the question, is there a systematic approach to the task of growing in Christian faithfulness that we ought to take seriously, but which we have uh, neglected. And my suggestion to you is, yes, there is. The Bible says that the normal path by which a man or a woman, but I'm talking to men, so by which a man grows to maturity is childhood. What's supposed to happen is the process of parenthood provides all kinds of uh, structures and supports rather like the um, little structure or the stake you might provide for a young plant to grow up so that when the plant is fully grown, the, the structure can be taken away and the plant has become mature. And what we ought to do is to replicate in adulthood a form of the kind of processes that should have operated in our childhood. And if we had perfect fathers and we were perfect children, would have so operated and we'd be kind of the finished article. We're not, so we need to replay some of those steps. We're like a, a fully grown man with size three feet. You know? We're mature and wise and productive in some aspects of our lives, but not in others. And so what I tried to do um, was to... Uh, highlight five things that our parents did or tried to do or should have done for us uh, in order to get us from childhood to maturity and then to recast those in a form which highlights how we must do these things for ourselves as adults. And they are the five numbered points, two-thirds of the way down the front of the sheet you've got. Um, uh, Very roughly, what parents do for their kids includes um, seeing where they are, diagnosing, my kid can't read, having a goal for them, be great if my kid could read, then he could, you know, read and function, basically, in the world. So we'd better put in place, thirdly, some structures. We can't just throw books at him or dump him in a library and expect him to pick it up by himself. We need to provide some structures for him, like a reading course or uh, Mum needs to sit down with him or I need to sit down with him in the evening or something. And then we need to track his progress, see how he's getting on so we can adjust to his developing maturity as he gets older and better. And we as parents need to be resolutely committed to this because let me tell you, if you don't know this already, if you've got children, you will know this already. Um, you can't parent a kid in three weeks and then job done. You know, it's, it's a long term commitment, which is exhausting, requires absolute commitment. Now, all of those things our parents did for us in one way or another, to varying degrees, when we were younger. All of those things we must do for ourselves if we are to exploit, so to speak, or reproduce the process of growing towards maturity in those areas where, as adults, we fall short of where we want to be. Are you with me so far? That's what we've got to do. Um, so what happens then uh, is that... Um, 65 guys come to a men's breakfast, and uh, I estimate some fraction, um, maybe a few tens of percent, go away and do some thinking of serious thinking about that afterwards. Um, maybe you were one of them. Maybe you you thought actually, yeah, man, this is a good idea. I'm 
I'm going to sit down and write a list of some ways in which I'm, I'm not where I want to be as a Christian or as a father or as a, a young man or as a, as a, uh, as a husband. Um, and then I'm going to, you know, purposefully pray about these things and then try and work out how maybe you did that. And I suspect quite a lot of people did that. I heard from a few of you. Um, I invited you to email me and a number of you did. And we've had some great conversations and that's beginning a process where uh, I'm, you know, just working with some of you guys just to get th- uh, almost um, coach you is the best phrase for it through this process. I know I'm only seeing the tip of the iceberg. I don't mean for a moment to imply that I assume if you didn't email me, you went away and immediately forgot everything that you'd heard. I'm not, I don't think that at all. I, I know that always that only a small fraction of people who are engaged actually get in touch. Um, but I also know that life is busy. I also know that um, we can sometimes become despondent. I also know that, well, I procrastinate. That is to say, um, I don't do nothing. I find other things to do which, though productive, are not the most important thing. Anybody ever done that? You know there's like the elephant in the room that you really need to sort out. But there are so many other things that you'd rather do than that, so you busy yourself with those things. Structured procrastination in my garage at the moment is a half-sanded section of our dining table that my wife is very patiently not reminding me about every single day. Right, today... I'm going to finish sanding it. Please ask me tomorrow morning, did you finish sanding the second? (laughs) It's like two square feet. I mean, for goodness sake, I've almost, but I don't like sanding. It's boring. I'd rather make something new than clean up something old. Why would I want to say? We find other things to do, and we will certainly find other things to do besides the painful task of scrutinizing our own lives and trying to figure out where exactly we are a hundred thousand miles from where we want to be is that not true and so i'm going to make you all do it today sorry not sorry um i want today to put us all in a position where by the end of today you will have at least had the opportunity to identify one or two or three things where you're going to go away and think okay i need to work on this somehow and i also want to help you to see how first then If you're feeling really despondent, turn with me to uh, Proverbs 30. In fact, turn with me there even if you're not. Um, Here we meet a man who has probably heard talks like this a thousand times. He knows that the 16-year-old lad at the table, two tables along from him, who's really paying attention to this, is far wiser, far more mature than he is. He's wasted decades of his life listening to the word and not doing what it says. Or maybe he's just become a Christian late in life, uh, later in life, and and feels he's missed out. And he just feels like, oh, I'm. this isn't for me. Proverbs 30, verse 1. The words of Agur, the son of Jeki, about whom we know nothing, <laughs> apart from what he writes here. He's a wise man, presumably, who came to the court of Solomon in 1 Kings 8, 9, 10, that kind of time, um, or from about chapter 4 onwards, um, shared his wisdom with Solomon, and Solomon thought that's wise, and wrote it down himself. The oracle, the man declares, I am weary, O God, I am weary, O God, and worn out. Surely I am too stupid to be a man. I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Didn't we feel like that? I'm just like, I'm useless. And if all the men half my age in this room knew how useless I was, how ashamed I feel. Well, I just hope they don't know that because then they might give up as well and that would be terrible for them. This has been terrible for me. I'm like old. I wish I was 15 again. Because I won't make all the stupid mistakes I've made in the past. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? So who has done that? Well, that's the living God. Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? I love that. Like, Surely you know. Well, we do know his son's name, don't we? We know the name of the son of the one who gathers the waters in his fists. His name is... Thank you. (laughs) Jesus, there we are. Go to the top of the class. So So having looked into the long-distant future and seen dimly that which we see more clearly... 
Where does he turn now? Verse 5, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him, however old and useless they are and feel. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. It doesn't mean you need to go and sit on a desert island with the Bible and nothing else. Don't add to his words. It means don't add anything else to the word of God. What do you, Nothing else has the status and the standing of the word of God. In other words, this desperate man who came to Solomon's court, presumably, and either told a tale of or described himself as being useless. Nothing can be done for me, Solomon. By the time Solomon had finished with him, he'd realized that God is in heaven, his son one day will be on earth, and the word of God is all you need. Hmm. Some encouragement for desperate men. And then I was reading yesterday, personal Bible readings taking me to Genesis 42. You've got you to check this out. Look at this. Genesis 42 made me smile. You know the, the narrative in Genesis from chapter 37 onwards, it's the Joseph narrative. Um, and uh, basically what's happened up to this point is that the brothers of Joseph have sold him into slavery. Then they've run out of food. So then they've gone to Egypt to try and get food. And Joseph has been like really rough with them and sent them back, minus one of their <laughs> brothers. Um, and Jacob is is uh, despairing, like, when are my sons actually going to solve the problem? We've still got no food. And then they all are, they've, they've told Jacob in chapter 41 of all, all the um, uh, different things that um, uh, have been happening in Egypt. And then verse chapter 42, verse 1, when Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his brothers, literally, what? You looking at each other? Literally, two words in Hebrew. Why are you just sitting here doing nothing? Are we just going to sit here and starve? Like, you have heard that there is food. Would you please get off your backsides and go and get some? The wise words from their father. And he said, behold, I've heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. It is the simple exhortation of a man who says, look, we, we know where there is food available. Please go and get some. We've, we know where there is food available. We know where there is um, bread, which isn't bread alone, available. So hear those words as an exhortation. There's, there's grain for sale. Who wants to come and get it? Anybody? And that's what I want to invite you to do today. The, the long, hard journey to Egypt or the long, hard process of examining ourselves. And as you do so, the next two headings I want you to... Um, uh, bear in mind, because we will need both absolute dependence on the grace of Christ and absolute commitment to personal self-discipline or self-discipleship. The, the two words are cognate in um, in Greek, and they, they even look similar in, in English. First, remember our absolute dependence on the grace of Christ. We, we talked about this last time. Um, I think I might have quoted from Calvin, tried to do so from memory and failed, or at least got it in, incorrect. Um, the whole shape of Calvin's theology is like this. God has given to his son, Jesus, everything. All wisdom, all goodness, all power, all knowledge and insight, all kindness and grace, all righteousness, all holiness. Every gift that we need has been, so to speak, deposited in a man. Jesus possesses everything. And therefore, the question Calvin poses at the start of book three is, well, if he's got it, how do we get it? And the answer is we need to be joined to him by the Spirit. And the good news of the gospel is that we have been. And so by the time Calvin gets to the end of book three, he says, this little quotation, I want to read it to you. This is in the section on prayer. He says, after we've been instructed by faith to recognize that whatever we need and whatever we lack is in God and in our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the Father willed all the fullness of his bounty to abide, what should we do? Jesus has everything. What should we do? Well, it remains, Calvin continues, for us to seek in him and in prayers to ask of him whatever we have learned to be in him. The simplicity of the the structure of Calvin's thought is so overwhelming and luminous, isn't it? Jesus has everything that we need. And so we need to seek it in him. 
And the way that we seek it in him is prayer. Men united by the spirit to Jesus pray and receive. Calvin even says that prayer is the first exercise of faith. And faith is that bond which the spirit creates between us and Christ. And all my Calvin students over there are kind of like nodding their heads and saying, yeah, yeah, we heard this 4,000 times before, because I keep saying it, because it's so central to Calvin's theology. Now, this is highlighted in those biblical texts I skipped over. I'm not going to read them all to you, but you know what they say. Let's just pick um, uh, Colossians 2, because I didn't share this one with um, anybody previously in this kind of context. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Paul has a particular way of expressing it, which is um, really quite moving as well as uh, illuminating. Um, Colossians 2, 9. Uh, For in him, that is in Christ, the whole fullness of deity, that is godness, dwells bodily. Well, you see where Calvin's getting his thought from. That everything that God is and has, all his perfection, dwells bodily in Christ. Verse 10, and you have been filled in him. We need to pause on that. Um, The NIV translates it, you have been given fullness in Christ. All the things that Christ is and has, we have. No exceptions. Everything that he has, we share in. And it remains simply for us to ask from him and to seek them in him prayerfully. It's, a, it's almost, it seems at this point like scripture is promising too much because it's so far at variance with our experience. Why is it that this is so far at variance with our experience? Well, those, those things are possessed by faith, not by sight. Which doesn't mean they're not real. It just means that we possess them to the degree that and in the ways that we exercise faith in Christ. And... Um, Faith is the uh, gift of the Spirit who unites us to Christ. And how often do we grieve the Spirit? The first exercise of faith is prayer. And, well, do I need to talk more about uh, prayerlessness? I won't. But um, he can do infinitely more than all we ask or think, Ephesians 3. But there is no promise of Scripture that he will give things where we have known we needed them and neglected to ask for them. Jesus' prayers, Jesus' instructions to keep your prayers short does not mean, you know, I pray for myself and for everybody, for everything, amen. There, I've got that covered. It's like, you know what I mean? He's like a father. So what we do, he is a father. So what we do is we we maintain and establish um, and and enjoy the ongoing enrichment of our relationship with him in conversation. If my son just suddenly stopped talking to me, I'd wonder what's wrong. They're like, don't you want to know me anymore? No, not really. Well, that, yeah. So prayerlessness, perhaps. Faithlessness, perhaps. But you're expecting me to say this because you've seen it before. Um, for example, in Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you. It is God who is at work in you to bind us to Christ by faith and to give us um, in and through prayer all the things that we ask for. Therefore, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul uses the W word, work. And like we're good, we're good Protestants, so we know works are bad, right? Wrong. Come on. Like the, the faith that saves is obedient faith. Faith and faithfulness are the same word in Greek, the language of the New Testament. There isn't a thing that's called faith where you have this disposition towards God and a completely different separate thing, which is a description of the lifestyle of a man of faith. You can distinguish those things, but they are labeled in the same way in the scriptures. They are the, they're so strongly correlated that a man of faith, a man of prayer, a man filled with the spirit is a man of work. And a, come on, right? You, you knew that. You've been, especially those of you who've been here any length of time and heard Pastor Neil preach for the last 10 years. And so no surprise then that we need in this fallen world where the members of our body and where our eyes and ears and fallen sinful hearts will pull us in all kinds of different directions. We need an absolute iron commitment to discipling ourselves. This is how 
the Spirit works in us. So it's not like the Spirit's going to do his thing, and then, well, I'll see if I catch up. No, the way the Spirit does his thing is by penetrating and transforming our will so that the work that he desires is created in us. Can you see that? It's a fundamental point of Christian theology. It's not that God does his work and then we do ours. It's God does his work in and through his vessels. This is why Calvinists are also evangelists. Because it turns out that um, God happens to have chosen some of the people he sends you to speak to. It's why people who trust the living God work out their salvation, because it happens to be the case that the way that God acts graciously to us is by penetrating our hearts and changing our lives. And so you see this um, in a few different places. And I want to just dump a bunch of scripture texts on you. Proverbs chapter 2 is really striking. Just turn back to Proverbs 2, 1 to 5. And look at the if, if, if here. It's piling up the, um, I think the, the technical term is the protases, the things that come before the then, highlighting in this really sharply rhetorical way what needs to be done in order to receive wisdom. Right at the start of the book of Proverbs. My son, if you're going to receive wisdom, this is what you need to do. If you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then, and only then, you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. It's not if you go to a Bible class and you get a B at least, then you'll find the knowledge of God. That's not what it says. You see all the striving and longing and yearning and seeking and searching and and straining towards the goal that the first three verses imply. And the same thing is echoed in all these other texts. First Timothy 6, I'm just going to skip through them very quickly without much in the way of comment on any of them. First Timothy 6, verse 11. As for you, man of God, flee these things, that is the love of money and all the, the ungodliness that comes with it. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called. See, look, look at the verbs. Flee, pursue, fight, grasp. Von Carson once said, nobody ever drifted into godliness. It's a brilliant insight. He's a Baptist theologian. You probably come across him. But he's at his best when he's bringing rich and deep theology to bear on the realities of life. And I've never forgotten that. I heard it in a talk that he gave in about 1995 or something. Nobody ever drifted into godliness. Decide. There's like 2,000 people in the room and you could hear a pin drop. Uh, First, First Corinthians 9. Let's just skip around here a little bit. Verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Imagine if there's only one guy in here who's going to grow in maturity in Christ. Now, that's not true, right? That's not true. But imagine if it were. What would you do? <laughs> well, the chances are like 2% that it would be me, so I might as well just not. Now, that's a, that's a strange and bizarre illustration because it places it at odds with, us at odds with each other. That's not the right way to think. But Paul comes close to that, doesn't he? Imagine. Like, if you had to be really committed, well, then what would you do? Well, maybe I'd be really committed. Um, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. So athletes will discipline themselves and, and... only eat the right food and get up at five in the morning to do their exercises to get a a little ring of of leaves that will rot in about two weeks. And we do it to receive an imperishable crown. Verse 26. So I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as one beating the air. It's a fascinating way of thinking. There's a self-disciplined, thoughtful, studied approach to how exactly I should be living in order to grow in godliness. Can you see? It's what I'm trying to get at with last week's outline and with the the numbered points here it's not just i'm going to try really hard well loads of people try hard and get nowhere i don't do it aimlessly 
I discipline my body and literally make it my slave. I enslave my body so that after preaching to others, I'm not disqualified. Now, you could be able to talk the talk really well, uh, be disqualified. Um, 2 Timothy 2.22 Again, flee youthful passions, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. First Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. Have nothing to do with irrelevant, silly myths. Rather, again, train yourself. Notice the language of training. It's taken from the gymnasium. Uh, you may know that in the ancient world, the um, athletes in the gymnasium trained naked. We don't need to do that. Um, uh, gumnos, from which the, the verb to train comes, it actually means naked. It's the nakedness place. But it's a striking thought, isn't it? I mean, it would have been a bit embarrassing even back then. Why would you do it? Well, that was just what you had to do if you were going to train, if, like, if you're serious about this. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying, you, you get the point. For verse 8, while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. For it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. Again, the language of training, disciplining ourselves is deployed here. It's, we're, we're to expect something which is hard work, emotionally exhausting, perhaps at times a physical strain to us, which bears no apparent fruit initially. Initially, it might make you feel more exhausted. The, the first thing that happens when you start taking seriously the process that I'm about to walk through with you in these five numbered points, the first thing that happens is you might start feeling irritated, like with me, <laughs> for ruining your day. You might. But just like the first thing that happens when you go to a gym is that you feel like, well, everything hurts. And then it hurts about three days afterwards. And then you go back again, and you go back again. And that's actually, then after you've been going about six weeks, you can lift twice as much weight as you could the first time, and it doesn't hurt so much. You notice that? Because you're making progress. But that's what the training illustration implies. Hebrews 5, turn 4 to there. I've got my teeny tiny Bible today, so it's fiddly, but anyway, I've got it. Oh, first world problems, eh? <laughs> Verse 14, solid food is for the mature. Well, who are the mature? Who are the ones who are ready for solid food? Well, you, you know who it is now, don't you? Um, those who've had their powers of discernment, there it is again, trained by constant practice. And then Hebrews 12, I'm not going to read the whole of this. Um, verses 4 to 13. Um, here, um, the writer brings together this issue of training in godliness with the the questions that have arisen in the minds of the Hebrew Christians about the sufferings they're enduring, which he's wanting to say, these are God's gift to you. So the, the pain of hardship and persecution is kind of sometimes combined with the pain of self-discipline. And, um, well, again, you you find the language of discipline applied to what God does. Verse 11 uh, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who've been trained by it. All these things are hard now, later, yield fruit. So um, that is designed, I hope, to encourage you. There's nothing you lack, Second Peter 1. Everything that we need has been given to us in Christ, that we should be known across the DFW area as the most mature, wise, godly bunch of men in any church anywhere. We're known, actually, for a bunch of different things. We're that weird church that kneels for confession, sings psalms. The guys get together on Tuesday nights at the cigar lounge and chant psalms. Weird. <laughs> but we're known for a bunch of things. We're known as the church which... Uh, thinks it's okay to have a drink, and it is. We're known for all these things. Wouldn't it be great if, if, in five years' time, we're all still here, right? And we're just known as that bunch of men who are really, like any one of those men, I could admire and aspire to be like them. Wouldn't that be something? Christ has given us, Christ has everything that we need. 
So to get practical, let me just remind you briefly of the things uh, that I mentioned um, uh, last time we spoke. And this is literally copied and pasted from the first handout, so I'm going to read through it very quickly. These are the things that we need to do for ourselves if we are to replicate in adulthood this process of training to become mature in Christ. Accurate self-diagnosis. We do not have the luxury of relying on parents to diagnose our shortcomings. We must do the job ourselves. We may be helped by sermons, teaching books, study the encouragement and rebuke of friends and so on. But in the end, we must take personal responsibility for clearly identifying those aspects of our life and character that we wish by God's grace to change. And later on, about five minutes time, we're going to do so if you'd like to do so. Second, clear goals. Having defined the problem, we must define the solution. What would Christ-like maturity look like in this particular area of life? Again, there are many resources that may be helpful, but ultimately the responsibility is ours. Third, well-defined structures. This is the hardest part. I'm sure this is the hardest part, actually. We're not going to try and talk about this today unless we have time at the end and you want to raise the question. Having defined the trajectory along which we wish to grow, because here we are, that's where we want to be, now we've got to figure out how to get there. We must put in place structures designed to inculcate those new habits, which will, over time, by God's grace, forge in us the desired character. You give a all kinds of resources to children to teach them to read for example you don't just dump them in a library so what would be the analogous structures for a man who wants to grow in patience with his teenage son and not hit the roof every time he does something stupid which is quite often (laughs) how would our father train us in that number four tracking progress just you know do what loving parents do number five absolute commitment because mum and dad aren't here to help so all happy so far Good. Delirious, I can tell. <laughs> All right, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to re- I've never written anything like this before. I'm going to read to you a somewhat caricatured, but I hope nonetheless uh, helpful description of you. This is how um, somebody might describe you, perhaps in a few years' time. It misses off all kinds of details. There are many virtues here which are not alluded to. But if the logic of what I'm saying is correct, and feel free to challenge me if you think it is not. That's one of the reasons I put so much detail in the previous handout. I wanted to allow you to scrutinize it because I may have made a mistake. But if I'm right, if Christ has everything we need, if we have Christ, if he calls us to faithful and um, Christ-dependent striving for godliness and if we're committed to those things there is no reason in the world why in five years time this would not be how a man describes you here goes i'm going to read it and then i've got the final exercise for you before we finish he loves his wife and it shows for with every passing year she seems to grow more and more radiant both with the inner beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit And with the overflowing joy and contentment of a woman whose husband is gracious, understanding, sacrificial and single mindedly committed to her. His children are happy and godly in large part because he's a loving, patient, kind and consistent father. He and his wife have created a delightful and hospitable home that's frequently filled with visitors and friends. He's a man of self-control in those areas where many men habitually fail, such as sexual purity and alcohol consumption. He knows that other women exist and that many of them are younger than his wife. But for years he has cultivated a studied loathing towards those whose feet go down to death, Proverbs 5. You can hear allusions to the second half of every one of Paul's letters and half the book of Proverbs in these paragraphs, I know. And for him, sexual infidelity of any kind would be unthinkable. He knows how how to enjoy a couple of beers, but he knows it's not possible to enjoy six or seven. He's unfailingly cheerful. He experiences adversity like anyone else, yet he's trained himself to endure hardship with gratitude as the loving discipline of a, hev- of a faithful heavenly father. His speech is measured and thoughtful, not hasty, ill-judged, reactionary or provocative, and always reflects the even temper of a man in control of his emotions. It's not that he never disagrees with others, but such disagreements are never knee-jerk reactions but rather reflect careful attention to what others actually mean. 
He has a remarkably long emotional fuse. Even under intense provocation, he never loses control. His distaste for gossip or slander is palpable. Not only does he refuse to indulge in it, but in his presence, others quickly desist also. When he speaks, others listen, and just a sentence or two from him seem to carry more weight than the endless rambles and rants of other men. He is prodigiously competent in his professional sphere. His colleagues regularly refer to him as gifted or talented, though in truth his abilities simply reflect the accumulated effect of decades of hard work. He accepts praise without either pride or false humility, but simply with thankfulness to God and for the opportunity to get back to work tomorrow and produce more of the same. He's organised, never idle, and consequently accomplishes a tremendous amount each day. Yet he never exudes the aura of busyness or preoccupation with work found in others who work long hours and which some men seem even to cultivate. He's a man of integrity, known by his employer, his staff, his children, his wife, and everyone at his church as a man who speaks the truth and keeps his word. He's proactive. He doesn't need to have work pointed out to him or be cajoled into doing it. Whenever he sees a job that he's doing, he instinctively just gets on with it. He's possessed by a generous spirit, tithes faithfully and regularly seeks opportunities to give in other ways. This sacrificial instinct is also evident in the other aspects of his service at church. At church events, he's frequently first in, last out, and no task, however unglamorous, is beneath him. He's equally at home in the company of many different kinds of people. In his presence, men stand up straighter and ladies are at ease, while children instinctively watch what they do and say, while at the same time feeling unintimidated and able to relax. He's prayerful, but never displays the kind of elevated pseudo-pious demeanour of a man who's proud of himself for being so. He's a man of the word and a thoughtful reader of theology, yet he entirely lacks the aggressive, combative spirit of some wannabe theologians and never becomes obsessed with doctrinal minutiae. Rather, he's a man of wisdom whose knowledge, which is extensive, is tempered by the recognition that there is vastly more that he does not understand. He engages wholeheartedly and thoughtfully in corporate worship, But though he's thankful for the care taken over liturgical details in his own church, this never becomes a point of contention or divisiveness. He's perfectly content to worship at the local Evangelical Baptist Church while on vacation. I nearly put charismatic Evangelical Baptist Church. (laughs) And perhaps I should. Shots fired. fired. Yeah, thank you. Vacation, I mean. Above all, he loves Jesus Christ and is committed to growing more like him. By God's grace, he is. Now, gentlemen, there is, there is no reason why that shouldn't be how all those other guys at the cigar lounge describe you. There's no reason. Apart from the fact that right now, all of us, myself included, know that there are areas of our lives where where, um, we're not the finished article. We don't measure up to this or to any equivalent description of a man, do we? At at some points, you might be pretty close. I can think of some men who are always first in, last out, or who are respected by their colleagues at work, or who are prayerful, or peaceable men of the word. I can think of guys like that. You guys, some of you here. All of these... Where do you think I got these virtues from? I I was thinking about the second half of every Pauline letter in the New Testament and you lot. I recognise these traits in you, but we recognise places where these traits aren't in us, don't we? And if I'm right, and I think I might be on this occasion, the first thing that we ought to do is to identify those places. And you have 11 minutes. And you've got three blank boxes. And I asked you all to bring a pen. And I have a spare one, if anybody needs it. Actually, I don't really have a spare because I need this one. Um, I'm going to invite you to spend five of those minutes just scribbling down in as much detail as you like. Uh, There may be things that you don't want to write down because the guy next to you might see it. I I need to deal with this myself before, you know, sharing it with Luis or something, you know. Uh, Fair enough. Um, why not, why not do this? Like, if you spent five minutes this year thinking about 
and trying to identify those areas of your life that you'd really like to change to grow, become more like Christ. That wouldn't be like overdoing it, would it? So why not make those five minutes this next five minutes and I'm going to join you and then we'll get back together with about five minutes left. Okay? Go ahead. I'm glad we can laugh about this. Like, So seriously, you've done something, you've just done something which most Christians never do. Yeah? Purposefully, explicitly identified areas of self-diagnosed lack of Christ-likeness. Well done. Like, well done. You've also implicitly set yourself a goal. We've done, like, two birds with one stone here. You look over the first side of that sheet again. So, accurate self-diagnosis. Well, let's assume you're accurate, if not exhaustive. We would be exhaustive, but, you know, you're not lying to yourself. Um, there's an implicit goal, which might need fleshing out in more detail, but if you've got a, a self-diagnosed area of failure, you've also got a tacit uh, statement of where you'd like to get to. Right. Um, the next step is going to be to try to work out what structures to put in place to get you from here to there. How would you train yourself? I think this is the hardest bit. I need to give some more thought to how to help you all to do this. Um, we're not going to try and do it now. Obviously, it wasn't my intention to do that. Um, if you want to get ahead of the game, just go ahead and think of something. And some issues are easier than others, right? If you want to become a man of the word, um, well, let me suggest you get yourself a little notebook and, you know, you write down a little note each day of what you've been reading in the scriptures and you put in place a plan. You want to read two chapters a day. And you're going to do it at seven o'clock in the morning with your cup of coffee, right? That's, that's a structure that's going to help you. There are other behaviors which are far more complex than that, which require more careful thought. Feel free to talk to each other. Not now, I suggest. Come and talk to me if you'd like some help with that. Um, we'll have another one of these uh, events in a couple of months' time, Lord willing. And it may be that we pick up that theme there. In other words, how do we practically go about disciplining ourselves? It might not be easy to do in a large group context because the issues themselves are so varied. It might be this is a sort of thing where it's best to have a one-to-one -one conversation with, with, or a conversation in a group with a bunch of other guys to get some of those ideas. But please don't do nothing. Minimally, minimally, this can be now a matter for prayer, a matter for more self-conscious running the race, striving, fleeing, pursuing, and perhaps for thinking about how to structure your approach to growth in those areas. Conscious that this is not some self-help thing. This is how the Spirit of God is at work in you. If you have anything written on that paper today, the Spirit of God has been at work in you. Long may he continue. Let me pray, and then we're done. Merciful Father, we ask for your help and your strength for steadfast resolution to pursue righteousness, holiness, faithfulness, along with those who call upon you from a pure heart. So please go with us today and equip us in the coming hours and the coming days to reflect on what we've articulated about ourselves today in such a way that we give ourselves more wholeheartedly to striving towards Christ-likeness in these areas. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.